two or three weeks ago, somebody asked me if I believe in prayer. They were in a time of crisis and needed to pray. And they said, do you believe in prayer? Now the company line is yes. My line is yes. But I don't know how it works. Last week, Heidi talked about the mysteries of faith and how we have to accept some mysteries as permanent mysteries. We may never know. Now the Bible says, whatever you ask for, believe you have received it, and it shall be yours. There are a couple asterisks. One is, believe you have received it. The other is, it keeps saying the prayer of the righteous. Of the righteous. Of the righteous. And I don't know about you, I really don't relate to the concept of righteousness. I don't feel righteous. But I do know that the Bible says, pray and I'll answer your prayer. I think we've all had those times when we've prayed. We've asked God for what we want. And it seems like the prayer is not answered. Certainly not answered in a way we desire. One story that I've shared with you a couple times because it was such a watermark event in my faith development was when my sister-in-law gave birth to triplets prematurely. We prayed. It's all you can do. Everything's in the doctor's hands. The first child passed away. We kept praying. The second child passed away. And this was over a protracted amount of time. The second child died. We prayed. That third child lived. Because I was in seminary at the time, I struggled. Because outside of the walls of the cemetery, or cemetery, uh, that's a Freudian slip, of the seminary, outside of the walls of the seminary, I felt like a charlatan. Everybody pray, everybody pray, whatever you ask for. I'm not righteous, but the cause is good. You can't get much better than praying for the lives of these children. Inside the walls of the seminary, I felt like an infidel. Because when I surveyed the ruins of this terrible time in our family's lives, I didn't embrace the mystery. I wasn't theologically curious. I wasn't accepting. I was mad. I was angry. I was exhausted. I felt impotent in communicating with God. If not that moment, when God? Do I believe in prayer? Instinct pushed me forward. But I retreated into silent prayer. 
prayer described in the contemplative practices, centering prayer, the prayer of unknowing, where you simply sit in front of God and say, all right, I don't have the words to pray, obviously. God, I'm going to present myself to you with no intent except that I am going to sit here in silence and give this time to you, give this attention to you. I will say nothing. I will, in fact, stop talking now. And that, starting in the mid-90s, became the way I pray even to this day. Fast forward, uh, or if I'm talking about today, fast backward, nine months uh, to when I started my residency. And the, the problem with the residency or the benefit of the residency was as a hospital chaplain, you don't plan programming. You don't do administration. You don't do um, uh, meetings. You are simply on the ground providing direct care to people. And what that meant was praying with them, in most cases, out loud prayers, and I had to say them. Fortunately, I was assigned primarily to the uh, mental health unit, uh, adolescent and adult inpatient and out, and that kept me busy. And a pastoral visit really focused a lot more on the behavioral sciences, and, and, and that I can, I can do. But then they would still request prayer, out loud prayers said by me. I figured that in that nine month period, a conservative estimate is that I was with 900 patients and their families. Multiple times, some of them. That was a lot of praying for a guy who had been practicing silent prayer. But after a while, I got into the groove of it. I began to enjoy it. And here's the only thing I can think of why. Because I would go in and my prayers are very awkward and spontaneous ones. But what would happen is the family, no matter what they believed about prayer, the patient, no matter what they believed about prayer, a hush came upon the room during that time of prayer. And I could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. I could feel God's presence amongst us. And I began to look forward to it. You want to pray? No. Are you sure? <laughs> you like it? What I looked forward to especially were the days when I would go in and it was a very intimidating situation and I wanted to present the most perfect prayer of which there are none and I would stumble through and I would go off on digressions and I'd be praying every which way and what it would do is it would make me remember I'm simply one of God's children trying the best to talk to God. And so not so much a chaplain, what I was, was another person invited into the holy space of a family suffering a major illness, of a patient in great pain. What a privilege. What a privilege each of us have when we're invited into that space. In Luke 11, 
Jesus' disciples had been with him for a while. Okay, this isn't Luke 1. This is Luke 11. They've been following him around. And it's in that chapter that one of the disciples comes up and says, Jesus, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray like John taught his disciples. Now, you got to imagine that A, many of these disciples had probably grown up praying. They, they knew how to pray. Secondly, there was something that wasn't done between that first and eleventh chapter. Why, why wasn't that the first thing Jesus did? You, see, you know, guys, we're going to pray, all right, every day. And that's how you're going to do it. But they were responding just after a period of time when Jesus had gone off on his own. And as you read the Gospels, you know, there's times when Jesus said, I'm going off on my own. Or Jesus went off on his own. And my theory on this is that John's disciples and Jesus' disciples both saw a relationship, a connection to God in their time of prayer. that they wanted, that they weren't getting in their prayer lives. Shortly before he was arrested, Jesus said, I'm leaving. I know this will upset you, but it's good that I go. Because another is coming in my place. And the Holy Spirit will be with you. The Holy Spirit will not be up there. The Holy Spirit will not be standing across from you like I am now. The Holy Spirit will be within you. It will guide you. It will teach you. It will comfort you. And so in today's reading, we get possibly one of the most significant statements about the work of the Holy Spirit in each of us. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words, and God, who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. There are times we don't know how to pray. The world is too complex. Human life is too complex. If I could, I'd still be praying for my grandma to be alive. But she's long dead now. At some point, that's what we do. We pass away. We'll pray for an end to war. We'll pray for an end to disaster. We'll pray for economics. We'll pray for whatever. But do we have the exact wisdom to know what is best in a given moment? And I believe that this is when retreating inside and just saying, God, I'm going to trust that Holy Spirit is interceding. I just want that connection, that sense of intimacy, But I have to trust that somehow you're at work. Do I believe in prayer? Yes. I just don't know how it works. The Benedictine monk, Augustine Baker, wrote, 
I do not understand prayer to be a matter of what a person expects to receive from God. It is an elevation of the mind to God and expressing or at least implying an entire dependence on God as author and fountain of all good. Hence, it appears that prayer is the most perfect and the most divine action that a rational soul is capable of. Do I believe in prayer? Yes, I think it is the most perfect action a rational soul can take. Why? Because when we pray together, it creates a connection of people equally baffled by what's happening. That sense of sacred space, that sense of the Holy Spirit. But also as individuals, it reminds us of our connection, our relationship, our dependence on God. My prayer journey is not your prayer journey. I think that is something that we will work with the entireties of our lives. And that is as personal to each of us as how we perceive and experience God. But we can know this one thing, that despite the anger despite the confusion, despite the frustration, despite the doubt. God is there and nothing can separate us from the love of God through Jesus Christ. Amen.